you know, the experience isn't always tied to the results and you can have a, you can have an amazing ride and, and not finish, right? You can have a great story to tell full of like type two fun experiences and, and not get to the finish line. And that is okay. And don't be discouraged by that. So yeah, my name is Megan Hackinen. I'm a Kelowna based rider and ultra endurance cyclist. My two wheeled adventures have taken me from Haida Gwaii to Mexico's high plateaus across Canada and the US and from North Cape to Tarifa along some of Europe's highest paved roads. I have a master's in fine arts and creative writing from the University of Saskatchewan, and I grew up near Vancouver. I've been competing in self-supported and a few supported ultra endurance uh, and bikepacking races since 2017 with a steady improvement in results. In 2023, I won four out of the five events I competed in, that's the overall, and I set new women's course records in every race um, that has a repeated route. Um, in 2024, I won all four of the races I competed in and the women's division uh, and one overall. I guess my best result was probably in the Tour Divide mountain bike race. I set a new course record on the Women's Grand Depart in a time of 15 days, 23 hours, and I placed seventh overall. So I'm really proud of that. It was a it was a big effort on my front. Um, as an athlete, I strive to push my limits and discover what I'm capable of, how far I can go. And this journey of self-discovery is something I've been able to document in my writing as well. So I published two books. The first one is South the Way, The Pacific Coast on Two Wheels. And it's about my first ever um, long distance bike tour with my sister. We rode from Northern BC to almost the tip of the Baja Peninsula. And the second one is Shifting Gears Coast to Coast on the Trans Am Bike Race that came out in the fall of 2023. And it's about my first unsupported ultra, which was the um, Trans Am Bike Race. And it uh, is kind of mm, me discovering kind of the ins and outs of this kind of underground, unregulated sport and meeting people along the way. And uh, yeah, just the highs and lows of adventure cycling. I can't guess that's about yeah that's that's about me well just to kind of recap some of that because i have not done a lot of bike packing or biking events i i'm having you on as kind of a novice with some of this what is the longest distance that, that these you listed all these events out what is the longest distance that you've done with these uh it would be the trans am um in kilometers it's like six thousand eight hundred. yeah kilometers right mm -hmm, that's right okay. That's awesome. And then do you have any idea how much like accumulative riding you've done? I have to look at my Strava. I'm sure it's documented there. I started using Strava in 2018. So that first event isn't in there. But um, like a lot, I usually average over 20,000 a year kilometers. And, uh, and then I um, do some hiking and stuff as well. But that doesn't really count in terms. Yeah, it's mostly on the bike. <laughs> I would have been shocked if you actually knew that number, but but you've done a ton, and uh, yeah, in, in the little bit of research I've done, just listening to the different podcasts, I I know that there's just a story with every single one of those different races that that we could get into. Uh, I think we're going to take a little bit of a different spin here. So you did mes mention that you have a master's in creative writing, and what I and you have those two books that you wrote. You do a lot of writing. Um, you wrote those books. Uh, you have this degree. One one thing that I'm trying to achieve with this podcast is it's it's to have people on you to motivate me to get out there, not be a LARP, you know, actually push my own limits and challenge myself, which I love how you dropped that tagline, push you like to push your limits. Um, but like another part is just being able to kind of reflect on my own stuff. So, you know, I did a marathon that was that was pretty monumental for me. But now since I'm I'm talking to these ultra endurance athletes like yourself and these runners um, next summer, I'm already talking about doing, you know, an ultra running event or something like that. Uh, just to level up myself and, and push myself. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of using this channel as a, as a way for me to document and reflect on some of that. There's a, there's a lot of things that I gathered from gathered and grew on when I trained for that marathon. And I assume that you just have a wealth of epiphanies that, that come to mind when you when you've biked as much as you have. So I, I kind of want to take that spin and, and how you you treat biking and writing as a way to reflect on on yourself and and these different events that you've done. And I, I don't know where we want to start with that, but uh, maybe you can kind of give a, a broad overview of how you think about both 
the activity of, of biking and writing and how you, you kind of use those to reflect? For sure. I got into writing because in my first longer tours, I, I, I was having all these wonderful experiences and, you know, sometimes hard, sometimes scary, but I wanted to share them. And I felt like I wasn't a great verbal storyteller or I would get cut off or I would lose the point of my story. And and so I kind of started sitting down and, and, and writing. Um, I think writing is a great way to to reflect and and try and understand your experience on a deeper level and it, it has a lot of value there even if you don't publish you know i talked to so many people and they are like religious journalers and i think that's a testament to the value of writing you know just even for your own eyes um my motivation was more to share my story with other people though so on my second trip, which was uh, across Canada, I decided to keep a blog and this was in 2010. So I didn't have a smartphone and I updated the blog at visitor centers and warm showers and couch surfing hosts along the way. And it was very much um, a lot of enthusiastic anecdotes about my experience. A lot of people dream about driving or traveling across a country. So I think that I was kind of tapping into that and, and trying to maybe yeah, encourage and support and motivate and show all the all the wonderful magical things that can happen on the road. But I would say looking back, it wasn't very deep or reflective. It used like as many exclamation points as Elaine Bennis from Seinfeld, I like to say. And I think that that the problem was I was writing straight to blog. I wasn't, you know, spending time with my own uh, thoughts much first. And there's a few stages of, of, of kind of like introspection. There's, you know, being on the bike and reflecting about something that just happened. And then for me, there's this other stage of sitting down with it and writing writing stuff down and, and seeing where it goes and seeing how you can make connections with um, past experiences or other books or other, other storytellers. And I believe that's really, yeah, I, I believe that's really important and, and makes for deeper, more satisfying work. So after the trip across Canada, I had this blog and I, I was glad that I documented the trip somehow, but I realized it wasn't great writing. So I went to school um, for creative writing in a very like, uh, like piecemeal way. I would take like one distance ed or in-person course every few months. And I was kind of just uh, learning for the joy of it. And I picked up a lot of craft tips and then in 20, I think 2013, one of my professors suggested I, I go back to school to do my MFA in creative writing. And I was really resistant because I didn't want to go back to school. I already had an undergrad. I felt like I'd spent enough time in education and I was not keen on, on doing any more studies. But she really convinced me and said, this is my opportunity to really just hone in on what I want to do. And and I was working as a barista at the time in Vancouver. And she was like, really? Like, I think you can, I think you can leave this job to go back to school. And uh, I, I did, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, my experience in the MFA taught me a lot about the craft of writing, but most importantly, I worked with a mentor to to really, um, I guess, refine my writing skills, to have a second set of eyes on things, to give me direction and ideas. And one of the biggest things that came out of that was just the need to I interrogate my own experiences and and kind of try to explain why and dig down. And, and sometimes those questions can be uncomfortable and sometimes we just want to tell the fun exciting stuff that happens on the surface but I think that people get bored with that pretty quick I think we want to know the deeper story and we want to know um, about people's backstories and histories and belief processes and that's that's all really interesting like juicy stuff but it can be harder to write about so I think that's what my MFA really taught me is that you um, you've got to have that kind of deeper personal narrative to accompany the physical activity or the physical travel or experience of being on a bike or whatever that is. Uh, so that's something that I've, I've really kept in mind. And, you know, when I'm going through like personal turmoil on the bike and it feels uncomfortable, I'm, I'm always like, well, this will make great writing. <laughs> so if there's something not right in my romantic relationship or personal relationships, I, um, you know, on the one hand, I wish things were better. On the other hand, I'm like, well, at least I can write about this. And I think that there's always that challenge of writing about other people. How much do you want to um 
expose those that you love and care about in the name of telling a good story. That's like a whole other podcast right there. But but for me, I've learned that I, I do need to reveal something of myself that um, is, is not always like the pretty fun side to, to tell a good story. Uh, I, I do a lot of reflection on the bike. I started using like voice memos. I, I type in a lot of little notes to myself that, you know, might just be three words, but they'll jog a memory later. I have something called a, a word list and they're just words to prompt my writing when I get off the bike and have time to, to write. And um, I, at this point, I've had such an awesome summer of, of bike adventures. I need to dedicate more time to getting them down on paper over the kind of cooler, wetter months um, before before they start like evaporating and before 2025 kicks up and I get really busy again. So I think the the writing kind of balances the the movement and energy. You know, having that time to to sit with something and and, and dive in without actually going anywhere is really important to me. Does that answer your question, or did I talk about like 10 million things in one breath? No, I think I think that's great, and we'll we'll definitely pull it apart. I, I uh, when when you're doing these, it, it almost seems like you're you're jotting down notes to spark either either memories of what was on your mind at the time, things you were working through, also memories of what you just went through, maybe like a cool town or you know a cool mountain range or something. And I, I mean, I think that's really cool. I I. As I said before this call, I did a marathon run training and I almost used it as, uh, I don't even know, almost like therapy at the time, because if there was something going on with my relationship, my kids, work, you know, a house project, if if I could put the side of time to go and run that one hour, two hour run, get that runner's high and just mull through all my problems that, you know, I can't be sitting there on my phone texting, I'm, I'm running, I'm in the zone. Um, I would actually get my voice memo out constantly and send myself stuff so that I could I could apply that to something when I got home. Uh, but I was also running locally, so there was never really you know an excitement of of a new area or of a a, a new challenge that I went through. Uh, so that that definitely resonated with me. Um, and I will say I'll go on a little tangent here. Like I get to write a lot with with my work, like distilling very technical, challenging things down to something that anybody can pick up and read. And I think that is so rewarding, just just kind of being able to, you know, d dumb things down for people that are trying to get into a space. And, and that's a, a massive skill. Um, I, I hope that one day I get to a point where somebody actually gives a crap about my story and I could I could write out something that someone would want to read. But since this podcast is still still pretty new, um, that's much farther down on the horizon. Um, yeah. And, and we wouldn't do a lot there, but those are just some things that popped into my mind. Uh, is, is there anything that like immediately comes to your mind when like big, big epiphanies that, that you've had on these journeys or maybe in writing your book? Yeah. One of the things that keeps coming up is just that you are, you are stronger than you think. And I think that I keep relearning that lesson every time I come into a, a hard situation, but I do think it's kind of nested somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, I first heard that saying from a spin instructor during a really hard interval in spin class. And, uh, and I've felt it again and again, you know, overcoming um, or, or kind of getting over the top of snowy passes and hike a bikes and, and just really atrocious weather conditions or kind of, multitasking as you're dealing with mechanicals and mud and you know a negative mental headspace and i i am just always impressed and and surprised by the the things that you can endure and it's really exciting at the same time i always like advise myself and other people try not to like put yourself in the red zone try not to put yourself in a very uncomfortable place where you have to sustain like you know, if you're if you're doing a hot race, like try not to get dehydrated because you can't be there forever, right? It's gonna it's gonna get you at some point. So, uh, I think I do everything in my power to avoid discomfort and make sure I'm well fueled and hydrated and wearing the appropriate clothing. But um, on on the other hand, when I when I get there, I do um, you know I do have some faith and and some 
satisfaction and, and getting through it and getting to the other side and knowing that I'm you know going to be strong the next time around uh and the other thing that is kind of maybe a bit of the opposite is just that like it, everything doesn't have to be epic you can have these very satisfying experiences on the bike where maybe nothing seems to happen you're just out there with the trees enjoying the wildflowers and the uh, chipmunks and the sound of the gravel underneath your tires and that doesn't make for incredible writing. I think you could, you know, you can have a little excerpt. It, it's kind of poetic, but um, it it still, I think, is very satisfying for the soul. And and for me, those moments where you can just be content and exist in the world are are really lovely. And I have a great partner, and he uh, he had cancer at quite a young age. I think he was thirty nine, and he came through the other side. You know, his hair grew back, and he has such an appreciation for just being healthy and alive in day-to-day -day living. So I think that he really rubs off on me in many ways. And sometimes I can be overly ambitious and overly competitive and stressed out about what people think about me. And if this, you know, if this ride is going to, you know, if I'm going to do as well in this ride as I hope to. And and sometimes he kind of just helps me get down to earth and and be satisfied with with existing in this beautiful planet. So. There's, there's two things that come to mind there. You earlier you mentioned people always like the to fantasize about a road trip, and we we drive a lot. We drive across country, load the kids up, drive. I, I feel like it's a Midwest thing. I don't know how it translates to to uh, Canada, but oh, it's a 20, 20 hour drive. Yep, that's easy. Let's hop in the car and go. And uh, yeah, it's just that you always fantasize about it, but sometimes those drives suck, and you you're just going through cornfield. There's nothing beautiful to look at. Um, but but it's always like a great story when you look back on it uh and then you saying you're stronger than you think i when i was training for my marathon I, I don't know if you know who harvey lewis is but he's an ultra marathon runner and he's done some crazy things where he's ran for like i don't know 30 hours straight uh you know 100 to 150 i think he did a 200 mile run and i'm just thinking like yeah if, if he can do that then i can probably make it over this next mile or make it through this make it up this tiny you know michigan hill uh so i often think of that and how we can you know kind of push ourselves at i, I don't know like people like yourself if you can do it then somebody else can and obviously it takes the training you want to be safe for it all but that's that's something that ultimately comes into my head all the time when i'm trying to do something challenging um I know in the other podcasts that I listened to, you talked a lot about discipline and, and, you know, that kind of ties with both of these, but how did you get into these bike races? I think you said that discipline was like a major part of, of your growing up and like, yeah, I guess maybe you can get into the story of how you got into biking. For sure. Yeah. I had a lot of energy as a kid and I was kind of like always mean to my sister and a little bit of a bully to other kids. And Mm, I saw my uncle do a board breaking demonstration at the mall for Taekwondo. And I was like, I want to do that. And my parents enrolled me in Taekwondo. And it was a transformative experience, like being in a class where I really like respected my instructor, I respected my peers. And I just did as I was told. And I felt very happy. I loved running laps at the gym. I loved doing push ups. I loved having to do the splits for like five minutes at the end of class. Um, um, I love the formality of bowing before sparring and and doing things as you know in little a little rows and stuff. And um, I didn't realize that was something I liked. And I I don't like this kind of drill sergeant barking at you approach. I've had like spin instructors like that, and I oh, sometimes I just yeah I'm not a fan. But to yeah, to be in a situation where discipline is required and you respect the people around you and you trust them and um, I think really helped me grow and it helped like help me feel much more satisfied and, and less angsty in my younger years. And throughout my years in sports, I've I've really found structure and discipline. So just doing like, uh, you know, free throw drills in basketball and drills in rugby and, and things that sound kind of repetitive and, and boring, but um, you get into the rhythm, you really focus on what you are doing in that moment in time. And I think that's been really important for me to kind of, uh, yeah, just feel in control and, um, and and learn those skills about focus that are so, so important. Uh, as an adult, I have kind of had to find my my own 
you know, ways of, of creating discipline in my life or people to <laughs> not discipline me, but as, as some sort of structure, right? So as a, a young woman, I discovered roller derby in Vancouver. It's a full contact sport played on roller skates, but it's, it's, it's exciting, but it's also a little dangerous, right? People are racing around the rinks and hitting each other and there's a lot of protective equipment. Um, but I think because that there is a potential of injury, you know, I, I took it really seriously. I did a lot of strength training off of skates and and just making sure that my body was in tip top shape, um, that I was I was really mentally and physically prepared to go into every practice. And I think that that enabled me to to really become a stronger athlete um, because I I realized the stakes were high and I took it seriously and I kind of structured my life around roller derby for a few years and I I stopped because of a couple knee injuries, one from roller derby, um, some from other things. But it um, yeah, it was it was a really great experience for me. And I've kind of tried to translate what I've learned from sports like roller derby, taekwondo, rugby, and uh, yeah, and, and kind of everything and bring that into ultra cycling. So for instance, I know that I, I need to do something off the bike. I need to make sure that I'm mobile and flexible and stretchy. So I, I, I need to incorporate that into my daily life. Otherwise I will get repetitive strain injuries. I will uh, have back pain. I also need to incorporate some sort of like strength component. Um, I need to be consistent on my on my training days. So I try to train six days a week and really make sure that I um, I adhere to that so that I'm not, you know, I'm not questioning am I training today or not. I just know I am unless it's my rest day. And I treat my rest days with a lot of respect as well. I really try and like, you know, use those as self-care days. I don't, you know, I don't go out in a six hour hike. I just try and be gentle and nice to myself catch up on on things I need to for work so that I can I can feel strong and prepared for the rest of the week. Um, I also enjoy what I do. So I wouldn't be doing ultra cycling if I didn't find a lot of pleasure in it. And I think I heard someone else, Evan Deutsch, describe bike racing, ultra bike racing is 90% is fun and 10% like really hard, tough stuff. And so I think of that as, uh, you know, hard fun. And I think that's I don't know, I'm bad at math, but that's like a good ratio to have. If you're having fun like most of the time and genuinely enjoying it, even though it's challenging, and then when it gets uncomfortable and you're doing things that like are just kind of gross and uh, you know, not ideal, um, you know it's not forever. You know you're gonna go back to to having a good time pretty soon. And I think that that, you know, hopefully will help my longevity in the sport because it takes up so much time and so much energy and you know, I, I spend less time with my partner, less time with my family, less time on my riding because I am out on my bike. Uh, so I, I need to, I need to enjoy it in some level and know that, um, yeah, that I'm, I'm getting out of it, uh, getting something out of it. And I'm not just suffering for the sake of a result that, um, you know, doesn't really mean anything. It, it's funny you say that, like I'm reading, uh, have you read Atomic Habits, that book? I have, yeah. Yeah, probably much later than I should be, but I'm reading that right now. And it's it's kind of talking about all these different habits and how to build sustainable habits and processes. So talking about discipline, especially as an adult, it's been super interesting. Um, I, I'm trying to like work out after after my kids go down every single day and just get in the get in the habit of you know being consistent with with lifting and whatnot. And uh, I mean it sounds like you've kind of carried that on through through growing up and everything. Um, Another thing I want to mention is, is there any like discipline habits that you've, you've taken on for, for your writing? Uh, if I was good, as good at writing as I am at biking, I would be a much more <laughs> successful author. <laughs> I feel like I'm always shoving aside my writing for cycling. When I wake up in the morning, I usually have a few hours of like really great energy and I can either, I can write, I can work or I can ride my bike or I can do something else. And I almost always end up working or riding my bike and not putting those good thought hours into writing. And I'm doing a writing residency for the first two weeks of November. So that definitely will be a chance to flip things around and, and prioritize writing. Um, but yeah, so some of the, some of the good practices that I do, um, which I'm definitely not as good at as, as biking, like I said, but I do a lot of free writing and that's kind of pressure free writing, uh, pressure free writing, but I call it free writing. And I just set a timer and I usually brainstorm a list of topics or ideas or themes that I'm going to write on. And I'll say like 
10 minutes for, um, you know, three times or 15 minutes for five times, whatever. And I just go through my list and, and write whatever comes to mind about these topics. And sometimes it's throwaway material. Uh, sometimes I will go through and highlight uh, sentences or pieces that, um, you know, could be very useful. And I think it's a, a great way to kind of just like flex the writing muscles and, and practice, um, you know, practice exploring your emotions and, and getting things down on paper. And even if it's uh, even if it's not going to make it into a publication, it's still good to be using those muscles because when you actually go to write an article or something, if you haven't been practicing, it's for me, it's really difficult. My first paragraphs take like hours. And then once I'm kind of through that hump, I can kind of get into the groove of it a bit more. So yeah, free writing is definitely something that I um, I, I do quite a bit of. Also, I'll jump back and say, like, you have you have kids. It's so much harder to have any discipline in your own life with kids. Like, you're you're supposed to be a role model, but you're also like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't imagine being responsible for anyone other than myself. So I think it's much easier to kind of impose these like six days a week training habits when there's less uncontrolled or random things happening in your life right like i'm not gonna have to take my kid to the doctor on a tuesday evening randomly because they have strep throat so there's a lot less interruptions and uh, it's easier to be consistent when you you just have yourself and i think that um yeah one of the things i do struggle with and have for years is just maintaining positive romantic relationships and um and training uh, and dedicated training and there's been like situations where i've definitely like brushed off dates and things like that so that i can just have a training session that i know is important for a race and um i don't know if i'm going to look back on that later and and regret it but um i mean it it's what i needed to do for my athletic endeavors but it definitely was not the best thing to do for my um personal relationships you, you say that and it, it is very very challenging to have kids and and do a lot of this stuff but it, it does really force you into like a box almost because they're awake for the this time period mm -hmm. that means when they go to sleep or when they're napping or in the morning that's when you really have to cram in the things that you care about and you know that that's trying to stay in shape that's you know trying to trying to squeeze in some me time trying to get some work done on the house uh it's really difficult and i'm, I'm trying to kind of figure out how to do that when they go to sleep so that i can get as much in that that like last few hours and still get to bed on time so i'm not a terrible employee uh, dad husband on, on the next day so it, it's definitely like a it's a blessing in disguise i'll say that much um it doesn't mean that i have less time to do these like crazy events and and you're getting out there and doing quite a bit of stuff which is awesome is there anything else you want to dive into with like the reflections either for me one of the things that helps me um when i'm biking and i'm not having a great day is listening to podcasts or listening to audiobooks and i think that that's a great way to kind of engage the mind in a in a different way and sometimes that kind of prompts reflections while i'm biking i can be like the third party in a two-person podcast or listening into a historical um you know story and thinking what would i do in that time period and i think that can be a good way to um, maybe engage your brain if you're if you're not feeling it or maybe you're feeling a bit sluggish or something i can't listen to like words when i'm up doing intense intervals so we're talking like long rides on the bike and zone two and stuff um but uh, you know, often when it's pouring rain and I'm not feeling it, I'll just have one earbud in and I will have like a 10 hour playlist of podcasts that I'm I'm just scrolling through. And it it really helps keep me uh, keep me engaged. And I'm uh, so grateful for creators like you who provide not just entertainment, but an opportunity. I feel like, you know, a good podcast is engaging. It asks something of its listeners to to consider and um like I can't really give any specifics, but I, I definitely feel like I, I engage with the material as I'm on the bike and um, that's that's important and satisfying. It's funny you say that because depending on the mood I'm in, it's either I need some inspiration to, you know, I need a podcast, a book, something to kind of inspire me to get going, or I just want to totally zone out and listen to my favorite artist. And, you know, depending on the length of, the run or whatever it never goes the way you always end up pausing it or switching or you know bringing out that voice memo because something comes to mind but 
yeah, that, that's a that's a really good one and I, something I'm relating to as you were saying that. Um, yeah, so I, I really like this. I mean, it's it's cool as a creative doing this this podcast. Uh, you know, you as a writer and just kind of thinking through or understanding all the different almost like mental benefits that come from pushing your body uh and then like sitting down and reflecting on all these cool experiences that you could have i always leave time at the end to go through stories or any stories that come to mind so you've you've been all around the world and it sounds like you hinted at some like couch surfing and stuff like that so you you've stayed with a lot of people a lot of different strangers i'm sure you have some crazy stories about about your endeavors um maybe you can go into a particular race you did or an encounter that you had or or a couple of them i mean we still have some time, so feel free to go long-winded on this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I did the Tour Divide this summer, as I mentioned, kind of in the intro, and I think that that was a pretty wild experience from start to finish, but one of the things that made it pretty crazy was the weather, and I feel like the weather was like a character unto itself. When when I talked to people, you know, when I bumped into folks on the race, uh, I'd be like, how are you doing? And they'd just be like, oh, the weather and uh now yeah i just um i felt like i was racing against the weather more than any other one person and that became a huge challenge and uh obstacle in the race so um i guess the first few days we got hit with these snowstorms just leaving canada uh heading into montana and it's like the eve of summer solstice and we're getting just pounded with snow which i guess makes sense for the rocky mountains uh, but I was I was just really impressed with how I kind of managed things and managed to take care of myself. And I was in this highly competitive mode, but I, I took time to layer up. I took time to put my gloves on, to put my like hot shots hand warmers on when my hands started to get cold, to just really make sure that I I rode in a way that was like kind of like competitive and aggressive, but also sustainable. You know, I uh, didn't get like sweaty underneath my kit and then freeze to death. And a couple of things kind of stick out. One of them was uh, uh, leaving the town of Helena and making this big climb up Lava Mountain. And there was a dot watcher, like a race fan on top of the mountain with a little warming hut and snacks and stuff. And and I didn't stop there, but I stopped to say like, oh, hi, nice to see you. How are you doing? And he was like, oh, yeah, um, you know, doing good. Like, this is a this is a really tough section and i said to him like yeah that last section was really hard like i look forward to going down and he was like no you haven't started the tough section yet <laughs> oh, no. and my head was just like what like it was this total mind shift like i thought the last hour or two were pretty hard and now he's telling me i haven't even begun it yet and it was snowing at that time and i uh just entered this section of like roots and rocks and really rumbly quad trail and you know the temperature is continuing to drop and it was a uh, kind of like early afternoon so the timing was good i wasn't you know i wasn't gonna get stuck out there in the dark but um yeah it was just kind of this funny encounter that i really didn't quite realize how hard it would be and on the descent I, I got a bit cold but and my average for the day was way slower than I imagined it would be but I felt really proud like coming down the other side that I had a uh, yeah I managed to to get through this and uh you know just keep the momentum going um I guess another another experience I had on the we'll divide. On that one. I I've never heard the term dot watcher like I, I, I'm I'm <laughs> touching all these well so I'm still pretty new to all this and I'm finding out about all these trail these like uh route trackers and stuff like that and you're seeing channels like youtube channels where they just stare at it and kind of monologue through it and uh as i've learned about these events i've i've watched it myself so that's that's just like really funny to me hearing that um i also want to ask this like when you're so it sounds like that was an off off-road event you've done your fair share of like on-road and off-road when you're doing competitive uh races like that like what is what are you allowed to take support from are you like would you been allowed to stop and you know camp with this person or take aid like what, what are the limitations to that so in self-supported road and off-road events the rules are a little bit different for each event because there's no like governing body there's no um like yeah terms that apply to everything but in general the idea is that you are entirely self-supported and can accept um aid from commercial sources 
um, only. In, in North America, I feel like we're more lenient against neutral support. So people who would be on the trail and there for everyone to, uh, you know, to offer like a coke or, or food or, or shelter or something like that. In, in Europe, I find them much more sticky about that. And I, in general, neutral support isn't as accepted. Um, but the idea is that if I have friends and family along the route or who come to see me, I cannot accept any assistance from them. They're not really supposed to come see you on the route. If I had friends in, um, for instance, I knew people in Salida and they came out in Colorado to see me, you know, just in town and that's fine but they couldn't like come up to you know the bc portion to see me because they're traveling out of their way so if it's just like convenient they can come say hi but they shouldn't be greeting you at random places that aren't near where they are um so it it, it adds this whole other level of adventure which i i absolutely love but it makes things more difficult because if you have a mechanical you have to deal with it or get your bike to um, a bike shop um, I didn't have any devastating mechanicals. I had a few things that I dealt with, like a broken derailleur hanger on the Tour Divide and a bunch of punctures. Well, not a bunch, uh, a bad puncture that took a bunch of bacon strips. And um, and it's always interesting to see how people deal and, you know, the creativity and the ingenuity. And like hitchhiking is, is kind of part of the event. If you get a, a bad mechanical, you would have to... Well, get to a bike shop, which probably involves hitchhiking in North America, where our public transit systems are not very good. And then you could hitch back to the route and continue on. Um, not all events allow that. I think it was the Colorado Trail Race recently. Um, Justina Slavikas, who won the Tour Divide, who was doing the Colorado Trail Race, he uh, busted his wheel. He hitchhiked to a bike shop. He hitchhiked back. And he was the fastest finisher, but he was disqualified because he had accepted outside transportation and that rule one of the one in that event one of the rules stipulates you must only move forward with your bicycle or like walk in your bike so um so i guess he didn't really have a choice he was at this position where his um bike was no longer moving forward so he had to deal with it so he would have had to scratch either because his bike was broken but he uh yeah finished finished fast but was disqualified or his finishing time didn't count so it yeah makes it more exciting but it's it's difficult because it's a really uncontrolled environment right and uh i you know i always come into my events with my bike fully tuned up and, and good to go but at the same time um you know bikes do break and i can think of times i did an event called ozark gravel doom this spring and uh, i forgot my pump so i bought one two days before and i attached it to my front fork it was really rough and i lost my pump in the first 20 miles of the race and i was super nervous because it was like a really rough like you know chunky course and i was like man if i get a tire like i i i, I Tire cut, I might not be able to deal with it. And I had a couple of CO2s, but you know, if I had a big gash, that wouldn't fill it up. And I'm not allowed to ask someone for help who's racing. So uh, I guess at that point, I just accepted that if I got a puncture and couldn't fix it, I would ask someone for help and then email the race director and like withdraw from the race and just keep competing like I'm racing so that I got to have that experience. But, you know, I just accepted that I might not get an official finish time, which I mean, is kind of a bummer, but, um, you know, you still have the experience. So with this uh, hut on top of Lava Mountain, I think it was a little contentious. The Facebook group, some of the people disagreed with it being there because um, it's kind of outside support. Some people said, you know, this guy really supports, uh, this guy really wants to be here and support the event and he's going to stay in this hut for a few days. So, you know, why he's not doing anything wrong. Um, I, I was competing, you know, at the point he ended that time and I didn't want to accept any help in case it, you know, eliminated me from the race. So that's why I didn't stop there. But I think the the weather was pretty bad. A few other people ended up camping up there in the night because it was, uh, I think he had a little heater and stuff. And I think other people accepted um, repair assistance and snacks from him. And it, it does get complicated because it, it it's not like a very well regulated sport, right? And some of the events, I would say more in Europe have more structure to them, higher race fees, you know, more volunteers and employees watching how things go. And, and in the kind of North American events, that's less so. It's more community driven, more grassroots, more community, um, I don't want to say policed, community monitored, which it just makes it uh, just makes it a bit trickier to decide what's okay and what's not okay and lacking clarity sometimes. I'm really glad I asked that question because that, that's a lot of stuff that I never even knew that I didn't know. Uh, wasn't there somebody who got disqualified because their, like you said, their family or friends were watching them or 
following them and just just knowing like just having that that uh thought that you had a guardian angel or someone watching after you was enough for somebody to fight and actually get somebody disqualified am i making that up no i i feel like that's probably happened a few times the most famous case that i could think of is with Lael wilcox and you know she just raced around the world set a record she's been such a a strong athlete and voice in women's ultra cycling but in 2019 uh she was you know doing the tour divide hoping to break her record and i had a media crew one of the rules of the race is that you're not allowed to have a personal media crew um so i think bikepacking.com sent out a media car and they were you know kind of just covering the whole race but in, in that was in this year i'm using that as an example but in 2019 she had a media crew and her partner was on the media crew and there was uh, a lot of That's controversy cool. over that and and people saying it's it's emotional support and i think that initially she was told that she could race but she couldn't have her phone because then she could be able to communicate with her partner on the course and and taking away someone's phone is pretty like it's i feel like it's almost dangerous like that's how that's how you check the weather that's how you book accommodations like I, it's it's really important to have your phone and it also connects you to your loved ones and other people in your life and then you can check the standings and um and there's been other uh yeah there's been other cases kind of uh with media crew and it is you know considered emotional support last fall or last August, maybe it was Lachlan Morton. He did a fastest known time on a individual time trial on the tour divide and he had a media crew and uh, he, you know, blew the previous time out of the water, but it did not count as an official time because he had a crew following him. And it's very clear that like you can't have a media crew if you want to set a fastest known time. Um, I think that's kind of up for each race director to decide. And as long as that's written down in the rules, I think that it's understood that that is to be adhered to. Um, and I kind of feel like there's a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, race directors, event organizers, they have a lot of power to choose how their events are going to be run, right? So. That's that's wild. I, I didn't even think I knew about half that stuff. So I'm kind of glad we went on that little tangent. Yeah, um, it's a wild world of ultra cycling. <laughs> and like you said, it's totally unmoderated. So it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, an honesty thing. You get to get to have integrity to do this and make sure you're not cheating um, for sure people really take pride in that i think that you know it's it's something people hold to themselves to a high standard and and really like you know had i gotten a flat on doom and i borrowed a pump from somebody like the event organizer might not find out about that, right? Like I might still be able to get away with it, but my conscience would never let that fly. Like I, I, I don't think I can live with myself and continue to call myself a, a bike pack racer if I didn't report that to the event director. And I feel like most people think pretty similarly. Yeah. Yeah, especially because you gotta just show your face time and time again, and you know, live live with that guilt. Yeah. As small as it might be uh no th this is great megan I, I think at this point we can kind of summarize it is there any like closing thoughts you want to do before we do shout outs and send offs um backpack racing is really exciting and fun and i would encourage anybody who's interested in, in exploring it to um yeah to kind of get your feet wet and i think just know that um you know, the experience isn't always tied to the results and you can have uh, you can have an amazing ride and, and not finish, right? You can have a great story to tell full of like type two fun experiences and, and not get to the finish line. And that is okay. And don't be discouraged by that. Um, uh, at the same time, I don't think it's for, I don't think it's for everyone because it really requires a lot of discipline and, and focus out there on the course. And, and some people get out there and they start racing and they're just like this, this is not what I want to do with my like five days of vacation time. Like, no. And I think that is okay too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to get out there and, and, and really like be on the elements before you um, make those yeah decisions for yourself. So. Salty Beard, the guy who kind of introduced me to you, he had a, a good segment in our episode where he talked about the fact that if you have a bike and a sleeping bag even if you don't have a sleeping bag if you have a bike you can pretty much bungee cord whatever you want to that thing and really give bike packing a try and ever since then i've kind of thought you know one weekend i need to just go ride to my local park or something go camp in the woods i love camping why not bring the bike with it and just uh 
you know, give this thing a shot. Um, so just to kind of bring that full circle, I'll link to that, that video if people want to check it out. Um, this is great, Megan. Is there any uh, shout outs you want to give before we close it down here? Uh, no, I'll give a shout out to Salty Beard for being a cool dude. I, uh, I love that guy. He's a just a really, really wonderful community minded individual. YouTube videos are great. He's influenced me as an adventure cyclist. And I, I went out and rode his um, Caves and Coves route this summer and it was epic. So I can definitely attest to that. Awesome. Well, hopefully this was kind of unique. I, I had a good time talking about it. Uh, I'll be sure to link your books and your website and everything so that the listeners can find it. Um, thanks so much for coming on. I hope you had a good time. For sure. Have a good one, Tyler.